Welcome to all of you. Thanks to Dave and to Katrina for inviting me to speak tonight because frankly, I love talking about this subject. <laughs> what I'm gonna tell you about is an epiphany that occurred to me in 2008, really just a few weeks after I came to the MGH. That epiphany altered the course of my career and it launched my colleagues and me on a journey of discovery that continues to this day, literally this very day, and frankly, doesn't have an end in sight right now. We anticipate that this journey of discovery will lead to new treatments for a major human disease process called fibrosis. Fibrosis is the medical word for scarring, and fibrosis or, or scarring is estimated to contribute to 45% of deaths in the world. Scarring, or fibrosis, results from many different kinds of injuries to tissue. For example, chronic inflammation, such as rheumatoid arthritis, infections, such as hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and just about any kind of end-stage kidney disease. So fibrosis is a very important problem. But despite its impact on human beings, and despite all of the medical advances in the past decades, organ transplantation, in vitro fertilization, cures for some kinds of cancer, there's still not a single effective therapy for fibrosis. I learned in medical school that fibrosis was essentially untreatable, and frankly, it, it seemed very unlikely that that prospect um, would ever change. So this journey of discovery that I'm going to tell you about is most remarkable in two respects. First, the whole thing grew out of a clinical encounter with a single patient, a 26-year-old woman from Casablanca, of all places, named Ara. Second, as I will tell you, in this era, this journey of discovery could only have happened at the MGH. So the story began six years ago when Ara was referred to me because of swelling in her neck. Ara was born in Morocco, in Casablanca, married at the age of 19, immigrated to the United States at the age of 21, and at the age of 22 had two beautiful twin girls. Her husband was a taxi driver, and Ara worked as the cashier um, at a local dollar store. After she became sick, she waited months before going to the doctor because she was afraid that she had cancer. She had this swelling of her neck, which was very painful, and she lost about uh, 20 pounds. Finally, after a series of emergency room visits and other doctor appointments, she was referred to me. And frankly, I was stumped, too. I didn't know what she had. I organized a conference uh, among the rheumatology division to try to get some of the best minds at the MGH to think about her case with me, and no one was quite sure what she had. But there was a consensus that Ara might be right, that she might have cancer, and we had to exclude that definitively. So I asked a surgical colleague of mine to biopsy one of the swollen glands of her neck, which he did, and then I waited anxiously for the pathology. I eventually went to the pathology department myself, sat down with the pathologist at the microscope, and reviewed the slides. And it turned out that the pathologist himself was puzzled because Ara had a new disease, and the pathologist had no context, really, to describe what he was seeing. I'm pleased and proud to say that we named that disease um, unfortunately, the name we've chosen thus far um, is not particularly catchy um, or poetic, but bear with me. Um, we call the disease right now IgG4-related disease. Why do we call it IgG4-related disease? Well, the Ig stands for immunoglobulin, which is another name for antibody. We all have antibodies as part of our natural immune system. One of the things we've discovered about IgG4-related disease is that patients with IgG4-related disease have a ton of a certain kind of antibody in their blood, namely IgG4. 
So this antibody is the hallmark of the disease in patients' blood. But the hallmark of the disease in tissues, in the organs affected by the disease, is fibrosis. Once we knew what this disease looked like under the microscope, that began the most exciting time of my career thus far. Um, patients, <laughs> patients with IgG4-related disease just began to come out of the woodwork. They had been there all the time, but no one knew what to call them. And over the next couple of years, we described IgG4-related disease in just about every organ in the body, in the aorta, in the thyroid gland, in the pancreas, in the kidney, and the lungs. And no matter which organ was affected by this disease, under the microscope, it looked exactly the same. We began to write about this disease. We discussed cases at Grand Rounds when invited to go speak elsewhere. We talked about IgG4-related disease. We discussed uh, this at national meetings. And before we knew it, we were getting referrals from all over the place, not just colleagues at the MGH in Boston, but all over New England, from every part of uh, the United States, from Canada, um, and indeed from overseas. Now, it's one thing to identify a new disease. That was really exhilarating. But it's more important, I think you will agree, and immensely satisfying to find a new treatment for that disease. And that's one of the things that we have done as well. We have a patient in our clinic named William, um, whom I met shortly after meeting Aura. And William's diagnosis was unclear, but it was obvious that he has had something wrong with his immune system. He had been treated for a number of years with steroids and with uh, chemotherapy, which he hadn't tolerated particularly well, and he had, uh, and had stopped, the, the medications had, had really stopped working. So William was thrilled when we told him that his true diagnosis was IgG4-related disease. And he was even more excited when we told him that we had a new treatment, potentially, to offer him. My experience in taking care of patients with immune diseases through the years led me to believe that a drug called rituximab might work for William. So we talked about this uh, with William, and he agreed to, to give it a try. We treated William with rituximab, and the results were absolutely stunning. Within two weeks, his neck swelling had melted away, and all other traces of the disease and other organs vanished as well. This was really a eureka moment for us. We then treated three more patients, including Aura, uh, with equally spectacular results, and then 10 more patients after that. We've just completed a 30-patient trial with colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, and now I'm working with Genentech, the makers of rituximab, to organize a worldwide trial of rituximab for IgG4-related disease. This trial will enroll patients on three continents, North America, Asia, primarily Japan, and Europe. And I am confident that one successful trial in this disease will lead to the FDA approval of rituximab for IgG4-related disease. And that will be wonderful for patients. So at this point in the story, we had identified a new disease we had found an effective therapy and we'd even begun to understand how this treatment works. And at any other medical center in the world, that's where the story would have ended. But because this story is happening at the MGH, there is much more to tell. At the MGH, we have not only the clinical expertise, but also a patient population large enough to identify emerging conditions such as IgG4-related disease. We also have the ability to ask the right questions about these diseases using the very latest in, sci in science and technology. But most important, I think, there is a recognition among clinical researchers and laboratory scientists at the MGH that we must work together for the benefit of the patient, that the, the patient is at the center of all that we do, and we must collaborate. 
Well, this collaboration in IgG4 really grew out of a personal obligation. Not long after I came to the MGH, I helped a wonderful immunologist named Shiv Pillai um, collect samples for a, a study that he was doing. Uh, Shiv was so grateful to me for this, and I didn't uh, learn about this until we'd been working together for uh, a couple of years. He was so grateful to me that uh, he decided to try to see how he could help me with this disease that I had become interested in, IgG4 related disease. So I told Shiv everything that I had been learning about IgG4 related disease and the patient's magical response to rituximab. And very quickly, Shiv was as hooked as I was on IgG4 related disease. And my own conversations with Shiv gave me hope that there were more eureka moments to come just right around the corner in IgG4 related disease because patients' immunological fingerprints that we could see in their blood really suggested that a specific kind of cell, a white blood cell called a T cell, must be important in the development of this disease. So to test the idea that a T cell was important, we collected samples from a small number of patients who had not been treated at all. We isolated their T cells and then we prepared to perform a state-of-the-art analysis, a genetic study called next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing has only been available within the last couple of years. So the rest of this story couldn't have happened at any other era. So we had collected the samples in the lab and then I had to go to Florida to give a talk. And I was in Sarasota working on my PowerPoint presentation uh, late at night. I began to get some excited emails from Shiv, ping, 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 um, telling me about what he called this transformational finding. The next generation sequencing had worked on the very first try. Now I tell you, science never works like that. Never. You remember what Thomas Alva Edison said about science. Science is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Never works the first time. But on the very first try, the next generation sequencing had nailed this T cell, which is at the heart of this disease. This particular T cell was multiplying wildly, driving other cells to produce the IgG4 that we were seeing in such abundance, and indeed orchestrating the cells of the immune system um, in a symphony of inflammation. So we studied this T cell further and very quickly learned a couple of other things about it. First, it is a brand new cell. It has never been described in humans before. We've discovered a new T cell. Second, this T cell has a unique marker on its surface. And in contrast to IgG4 related disease, this marker has a great catchy name. It's called SLAMF7. Slam F7. So in short, we think that this T cell is driving the fibrosis, not only of IgG4 related disease, but of a number of different human conditions. And most exciting of all, perhaps, this T cell is druggable, by which I mean we can design an antibody in the lab which will home to the SLAM F7 and remove the cell that is causing this disease, leaving all normal healthy cells untouched. So our next steps are very clear. We're going to pursue um, an anti-SLAM F7 treatment strategy in IgG4-related disease. We have obtained what is called a use patent uh, for any therapeutic attempt at uh, treating fibrosis, not only um, in uh, IgG4-related disease, but in any kind of fibrosis that targets SLAM F7. So there are a variety of different um, options that are available to us now. At the same time, we are expanding our discovery efforts to determine just how widespread this T cell is among a whole variety of uh, diseases associated with fibrosis. 
And as I move to close my remarks, um, let me say that new eras in medicine are often heralded by breakthrough discoveries. Uh, the discovery of penicillin, the discovery of insulin, the development of the polio vaccine, the uh, decoding of the human genome, as Jose will tell you about. Breakthrough discoveries take problems that appear intractable today, Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, Parkinson's disease, and all forms of human disease that are associated with fibrosis, and they somehow make their solutions seem within our grasp. We're now on the verge of next steps that will make it possible, we believe, to treat fibrosis effectively for the first time in history. So we have obviously been very excited about all this for the past six years. One of my postdoctoral fellows encapsulated that excitement beautifully with one sentence um, recently. Uh, Emmanuel is from Italy originally, and he came here to the MGH to work with us because he had read about our work in, in the medical literature. And one day not long ago, I said to Emmanuel, you know, Emmanuel, I'm just stunned at how fast we've been able to move this along and learn about this disease. And Emmanuel nodded his head excitedly and said, yes, we can feel the science moving in our hands. We can feel the science moving in our hands. Thank you very much.